Hey gang, I am Joe Weddleman and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. If you're watching live, please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries, you are still an important part of this community. So please drop a comment below the video so that I know you were here. Gosh, already tonight, uh, we got a lot of people here tonight already. Let's see here. We got David out in, uh, I believe, California. Greg is in Guam. I got Eric down in San Antonio. Sandra in Alberta. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Joe in <laughs> the best place to live in the U.S., uh, Vista, California. Okay, Joe. Uh, Jay Yap in Southern Colorado. Let's see. We got uh, Jeff from Maryland. Roger in Kentucky. Uh, I got Coast to Coast down in Florida. Great to see all of you. Lynn sneaking in here from New York, and Andre is here from Mexico City. Andre, I have your question to answer tonight. I'm ready for you, okay? Um, awesome, gang. All of you, thank you so much. Uh, I got a lot for you, so let's dig in, okay? Here we go. All right, so the power of AI technology gives us a cool new feature in Adobe Lightroom and Camera Raw, and that is Lens Blur. Next week, I'm gonna actually show you a demo, break it all down, but just so that you know it's there, so you can go and check it out and give it a whirl and play with it, because it's got a lot of potential. Lens Blur is available in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, Lightroom for mobile, Lightroom for web, and Adobe Camera Raw, and it's literally listed as an early access feature. It's got a little blue button uh, alongside of it, but basically what it's allowing you to do using AI is to very easily apply optical blur and bokeh adjustments through uh, what Adobe likes to call an interactive experience that lets you define the blur amount and refine the focus. Um, they're using the Adobe Sensei technology that they've been working on, which basically relies on depth maps um, to create this. Um, you select the blur amount using a slider, and then the overall look of the blur. Um, it allows you to choose from five different blur types, which are similar to the various different bokeh types that are created by different lenses. And then the blur amount corresponds to the f-stop of the lenses. You can also adjust the focus area in the image, uh, change how big the depth or depth of field is and how the blur is applied. So it's actually really pretty cool. You can read more about it on the Adobe website and also at petapixel.com. Links are below the video. Um, as I mentioned, I will give you a little walkthrough of it next week. I had all of about 20 minutes to kind of toy around with it today. Um, and I have to say it looks very, uh, very promising. And as that technology gets better, again, big picture, because I talk about this a lot. I know that AI stresses a lot of you out. Don't stress, just be aware, right? Um, because here's one of the potential things that happen with this. As it gets better to the point where we can actually really rely on it, it gives us the ability as photographers, and this is especially beneficial to amateur photographers, but also professional photographers, to not have to spend so much money on f1.8 lenses or f1.2 lenses or 1.4 or whatever, because you can bump up that shallow depth of field and boost that bokeh a little bit in post-production. Is it there yet? And is it amazing yet? Well, it's an amazing thing because of what it's able to do. But no, it's it's not ready for prime time in terms of, yeah, don't spend the money, just go with 2.8 lenses, and you'll still be able to get f1.4 bokeh. We're not there yet, but I'll tell you what, wouldn't surprise me if we get there not too far down the road. Uh, the last uh, new bit that I have for you is actually my own news item regarding the last frame. From this point forward, um, as a rule, we're going to call it an editorial rule. I'm not going to report on new cameras, new lenses, new lighting gear, unless there's some feature that is just revolutionary in the industry and is likely to change the way we approach photography. So the photo news section is going to 
uh, stick to industry updates and issues that impact the hows and the whys behind what we do. Uh, also, just a real quick note before I move on, because I don't really have a section of the show for this. I just wanted to apologize for all of you that I had to cancel last week's show, but I'll give you full disclosure. It's not a big secret. Unfortunately, my wife took a tumble down a set of stairs while actually I was out of town last week or two weekends ago doing a presentation. I was fortunate I was in my car on the way home. She uh, very adeptly managed to break four ribs, the 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, bruised her left lung, and broke a toe. Uh, so she has obviously been rehabbing. If you've ever broken ribs, uh, you probably understand it's extremely painful, especially for the first couple of days of the first week. Uh, so we've been you know, working through that and it just kind of turned life upside down a little bit. But she's doing great. She's going to make a full recovery. Uh, I'm finally getting back into the swing of things. Uh, so I'm excited to be back here tonight. But that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. Now, I do have some presentations coming up for camera clubs, but nothing that's open to the general public, so I'm not going to waste a lot of your time on that stuff. However, do remember that you can um, bookmark my education page. It's updated weekly as new presentations are added to the schedule. You can also find that link in the description below the video. I do, however, want to share a link with you to sign up for my email newsletter. Uh, between now and the middle of October, I'm going to be announcing some really awesome learning opportunities. And the subscribers to my email newsletter will not only have first access, but they'll have first access at some discounted prices. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, oops, I'm showing you the wrong link. Here it is right there. Uh, I am going to drop that link in the chat. It is also in the description below the video. And look, don't worry, you have my word. I don't spam you with my newsletter. Uh, I literally only send one out every like month or two, sometimes even three. In other words, if I have something to share, I send out a newsletter. I do not and never will uh, sell your um, email address or any of that kind of information. So you do not have to worry about that at all. My mother, yes, my mother was born and raised in the East End of London, England, and she spent her early teen years experiencing World War II. Because of that, the British royal family was always of interest to me, and during my early teen years, as I was getting into photography, I first became aware of a British photographer who had photographed many members of the royal family and who is responsible for many of the iconic images that we have of the royals. So this week's quote is from the British icon, Norman Parkinson. The quote, the only thing that gets in the way of a really good photograph is the camera. Parkinson, who lived from 1913 to 1990, was a British portrait and fashion photographer who revolutionized the field. His work has appeared in major publications such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, and his photographs were really pivotal in creating the age of the supermodel and certainly made him the photographer of choice for many celebrities, artists, presidents, and prime ministers. Um, he was definitely a permanent fixture at historic moments photographing the British royal family, both in public and private, uh, as well as leading figures from the worlds of film, theater, and music. Uh, some of his more famous subjects included Audrey Hepburn, The Beatles, Twiggy, Grace Coddington, David Bowie, Iman, Jerry Hall, and that list goes on, right? So his quote is an excellent lesson, in my opinion, for both new and experienced photographers. It's often said that when photographing people, 20% of the task is photography. Some would say, myself included, that's the easy part. And then the remaining, the 80%, is psychology. To me, this quote highlights that point, as you can see in Parkinson's work, that he's an excellent storyteller. 
and excels in bringing the viewer into the scene with the subject. In order to do that, he has to be an invisible part of every scene, interacting with the subjects on a personal level, and that is something that you can't do when you hide behind a camera or waste time fumbling with gear and settings, right? So I have a link to his website in the description below the video. I encourage you, spend some time there, read his bio and study his images. You will learn a lot. In any case, you don't follow me on Facebook, Twitter, X, Threads, or LinkedIn, every day, Monday through Friday, I post a quote from a well-known photographer along with a link that allows you to learn more about that photographer as well as to see some of their work. And just a reminder, gang, you're all part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. It would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame if you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. Our 10 minute lesson for tonight. Stop asking what's the best. Easy for me to say, right? But what should you be doing instead? You know, almost daily, I speak with photographers, I get emails, I get message from, messages from photographers of all skill levels who ask a question that begins with, what's the best? What's the best camera or lens? What are the best settings? What is the best time of day to shoot? What's the best software? Camera bag, background, modifier, strobe? I think you get the point. So it's time to address the elephant in the room. The obsession with finding the best equipment and the best settings, frequently it hinders your creativity and your growth as a photographer. So I'm gonna coin this, my phrase, the illusion of the best because it really is just an illusion. There is no best. Don't tell your competition. Before diving into why we should stop asking for the best, let's first acknowledge some of the reasons why this question, what is the best, is so tempting. It's tough and it's challenging for many people to know what is best to think or say or do in various situations and relationships, like real life stuff, right? Now, much of this confusion, it happens because we live in a time of information overload. For morning tonight, we're bombarded with information about what we should and shouldn't do to be successful and to be happy and to be the best. And add to that, not only does everybody have an opinion, but thanks to social media and having the whole world online and at our fingertips, we also have access to everyone's opinions and ideas all the time, <laughs> whether we like it or not. Look, the reality is that everyone has an opinion. I think photographers have more opinions than others, but that's a different discussion, right? Now, there are experts everywhere. And this brings us to the first reason that we all want to be right or correct. We're trained, not taught, we are trained. The training begins all the way in preschool. And that lesson, it's reinforced for the rest of our lives. Being wrong just sucks. Failing sucks. Unless, of course, you're failing for the right reasons. All of you genuinely creative folks understand that idea of failing for the right 
reasons. Now, the second reason and the part that impacts our conversation the most is that it's human nature to seek efficiency and perfection. I know I struggle with that one. In photography, we often believe that having the best tools will lead to the best results. And since gear is so expensive and the fear of failure is so intense, we want the best and we want to be sure that our choices are correct so that we can have a false sense of confidence. Yeah, it is a false sense, even though it feels like confidence. It's a false sense of confidence. Not to mention, this gear we're talking about, it's expensive. So we don't want to find out that we purchased the wrong item, right? We want to buy the correct item. Now, we all know that it's not the camera or the gear that makes the image great. Just don't tell my wife I said that, please. You know what I'm talking about, right? Look, the problem with this mindset, serious note here, the problem with this mindset is that it oversimplifies the complex art of photography. Yes, photography is complex, regardless of how simple Apple might make it in your smartphone or Google in your Pixel phone, right? What's best for one photographer or situation may not be for another. There's simply no one-size-fits-all answer to questions about settings or lenses or modifiers or software because photography is inherently subjective. The only aspect of photography with simple answers that can be answered with best, those are the elements of physics. Things such as depth of field, the inverse square law, optical properties, stuff like that. They're all simple because they're controlled by math and physics, which also means they're predictable, right? So that brings us to the importance of context. One of the fundamental reasons that we should stop asking what is best is that the correct answer depends on the context. What emotions or stories do you want to convey? What are the environmental conditions? What's your personal style? How will the photo be displayed? Who is it for? And I could go on and on and on. In short, it all comes down to one of my favorite words and questions, why? But the answers to those questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, they give us context. Those factors should be crucial in determining the right choices for your photography. Let's use a little science for a second. Research in psychology and also photography education has shown that asking the why questions and considering the context will significantly improve one's photographic skills. So, for example, emotion in storytelling. Research in psychology has highlighted the importance of emotions in photography. You can make more deliberate creative choices by asking yourself, why are you taking a particular photo and what emotions do you want to evoke? Next one, oh, my apologies, there we go. Environmental factors, different shooting conditions, such as low light, fast motion, close-up shots, all require different and specific settings and equipment to photograph them well. So understanding why you need a particular setting or a lens in any given situation will lead to better results. And please understand, pun intended, that understanding turns into skills, or I refer to it as 
more tools in the toolkit. Also consider personal style. Photography is an art form and your personal style, it matters. So instead of blindly following what others consider best, you know, being a zombie photographer and brainlessly just following the crowd and chasing all the trends, you should be exploring and experimenting to develop your own unique voice. Another issue in the world of photography is the prevalence of lazy questions. These questions are the ones that are overly simplistic and they often seek shortcuts rather than a more profound understanding. Some examples of those questions would include, what's the best camera or what's the best preset or what's the best lens? Look, to grow as a photographer, we have to put in the effort. We have to put the effort into more thoughtful inquiries. Instead of asking for a one-word answer, yes or no, or um, you know, use a 50 millimeter instead of 135 millimeter. Instead of asking for that one word, simple answer, delve into the reasoning behind the choices. For instance, instead of asking, hey, what's the best lens for portraits? Ask, what qualities should I look for in a lens to achieve a specific portrait style? Because a portrait is not a portrait is not a portrait. There are some incredibly interesting and visually stunning portraits shot with fisheye lenses but that's counterintuitive. So rather than seeking the best settings for a particular scene, better yet consider how can I adjust my settings to capture the mood and the atmosphere that I envision? Ansel Adams and others refer to that as creating the image that is in your mind's eye. It's visualizing what you want the outcome to be. So in conclusion, there is no universal best for anything in photography. The concept of best is subjective. The concept of best is context dependent, and it can and will likely hinder your ability to grow creatively. So instead of seeking shortcuts, focus on asking the why questions, the questions that help you understand the reasons behind your creative choices. Remember that photography is an art form that thrives on creativity, personal expression, and storytelling. Embrace the journey of discovering what works best for you in different situations, and you'll find that your skills and creativity will flourish. So let's stop asking what's best and start asking why to unlock our full potential as photographers. Now, some of you are going to call me out and say, hey, wait a minute, the title of tonight's show said that there's a hack for doing this. There is. So let me give you the hack in a short, concise statement. Stop being lazy. Do the work. That's how you get good at this stuff, right? Okay, so listen, did you hit that thumbs up yet? Hopefully you did. If you're still watching, come on, right? You must be finding some value in this program. And, and by the way, like if you really think I'm wasting your time, you can go ahead and you can hit the thumbs down too. It's okay. It helps me either way, right? I'm just asking for your help to get the word out, okay? This week's tip is all about catch lights. And I'm gonna apologize in advance because literally as I press the button, I realized I forgot to grab the thing that I wanted to show you, but it's okay. I have a picture and I can describe it and you'll totally get it. My apologies. But listen, if you're new to lighting uh, and portraiture, this tip is something that you definitely want in your knowledge base. But if you're new, don't stress too much about it in terms of, actually doing it all the time if you're new. As your skill level improves and you're ready to add some real polish to your portraits and actually people pictures in general where you're doing lighting, 
this is a topic that you should pay a lot of attention to. So catch lights are caused by a light source that produces a reflection in the eye. Without catch lights, eyes tend to look flat, kind of dead, right? And pay attention, this month, television, you'll see lots of horror movies for Halloween where they intentionally avoid having catch lights in the eyes to help make the zombies look more dead. However, this does not really make for the most pleasing portraits. With eyes in the shadow, there are no catch lights and the eyes look dark and flat. Now, for years, boring photographers, yeah, I'm saying it, boring photographers oh, and, and contest judges, can't forget them, they've spouted the idea that just having the catch light, excuse me, not just, that having the catch light in the 10 o'clock or two o'clock positions as if the eye were a clock, but they claimed that that was ideal. The thinking was that if the catch light is too centered, like in the middle, it can make it seem as though the subject is in pain or even make them look somewhat alien with a light shining directly into their pupils. In the real world, catch lights aren't always at 10 or 2 o'clock, but they are almost always in the top half of the eye. In fact, by the time we are aged two toddlers, our brains are hardwired to expect that light will come from above. Hence, when you walk into a room, the lights are on the ceiling, not the floor. So the concern about the catch light being in the middle, so this comes back to that word that I talked about a few minutes ago, context. The concern about the catch light being in the middle, it's really a matter of the type of light source, or more likely, the type of modifier that you're using. If it's a small point light source, it really won't matter. It legit won't. If you're using a big modifier that's creating a big catch light, well, then it definitely can. So the bottom line is, you don't want the catch light to be distracting. That's the working philosophy that I work with, period, right? I don't want the catch light to be distracting, unless that catch light adds something to the character or concept. Meaning like I have some fashion portraits that I've done that are, you know, rather alien looking where they've got, you know, these like V-shaped vertical catch lights that make the person look really alien looking. It adds to the character, but we're going to stick with a basic portrait at this point. So, you know, just like our 10 minute lesson that we did tonight, there's no clear cut right or wrong. It depends on the context. Now to the DIY tip. For those of you that are still refining your lighting skills, a great way to practice is with a black marble. That's all you need is a black marble. And I have a link below the video uh, to Amazon where you can actually get this little kit here with a bunch of marbles of all different sizes. And again, I apologize that I forgot the marble. So I'm going to use, um, this is just a battery. I can cheat to give you the concept, but almost like you were making a hand puppet, take and put the marble in your hand like so. Now remember, this is going to be a black marble, right? And go ahead and photograph it, do a test shot. Set your camera up on a tripod, do your test shot and go and preview it. You are going to be able to see the size of the catch light and the placement of the catch lights. So think about this now, when you are photographing people in a studio type setting, now it could be on location, but if you're using lighting, right? Ideally, you always want to have your lighting set and your exposures worked out before your subject walks on to the set. Super important. That way you are able to pick the camera up and start making pictures right away, which builds your confidence and also has or creates a situation where your subject will relax and have more confidence in you and what you're doing. So it's a great way to be able to test. And it's also a great way for you to build a workflow to compartmentalize in your brain so that you're not too scattered by saying, okay, I need to check the catch lights, boom, right? Does it need to be 10 or two? No. Should it be in the top half? Yes. If it's too low in the eyeball, that says to you, you've got your key light too low. Move it up. 
right? So again, we're going to do this before the subject gets in front of the camera, which makes the black marble a great way to practice it. If you have some kids at home, you may not have to buy them. You may already have them floating around the house. And in theory, you could do it with uh, almost any color marble, but the black marbles work really, really awesome. In fact, if, if I go back to that picture, um, let's see here. Whoops. Uh, let's hit that one, and it would help if I hit the right one. There we go. If you look at the marbles on the bottom, you can actually see that those pictures, the marbles on the bottom, were lit with um, one round uh, octobox above the marble and two rectangular white reflectors on either side, right? So that's what's great about the black marble. It really shows off um, the reflections of uh, the catch lights. So also, I do have a video um, how to get perfect catch lights in your portraits. You can find the link in the description below the video. Okay? All right. Ooh, my favorite part of the show. How can I help you with your photography tonight? That's great. I got through everything in just about a half an hour. So we got a lot of time for your questions. Now, uh, if you're here live, start typing. Okay. And by the way, if you are watching this um, on the replay, because you know this is not a convenient time for you, I understand. I'm sorry. But you can still ask questions and you can still get help. My whole point for doing this is to offer my knowledge to you for free. It's not costing you anything. So if you need that help, go ahead and type your questions in the comments below the video if you're watching the replay, and I will deal with them next week, okay? So I do have uh, two questions from Andre, who I believe is here, um, that were from previous um, last frame and actually miss them. So I'm kind of going back a couple of weeks to get these. But uh, again, if you leave me questions, I will make it a point to answer the questions. So uh, Andre's question, I know it's very easy to create perfection and eliminate all trace of humanity out of a picture. Uh, he's talking about retouching, right? Uh, just as it is sometimes done with music. I guess that's a reference to like auto-tune. Um, he goes on to say, I tend to edit in a very natural way to avoid that, but that sometimes looks a bit flat. So his question is, how can you tell when you over-processed and over-edited a picture? Can an over-processed picture look more interesting than a properly processed one? So, Andre, first of all, thank you for asking the question the way that you did because it wasn't a lazy what's the best, right? The challenge with your question is there is no definitive answer that I can give you to the, the two questions that are in there, right? How can you tell when over processed, uh, when you over processed or over edited a picture? And can an over processed picture look more interesting than a properly processed one? So, actually, the second question yes. Can an over processed picture look more interesting than a properly processed one? Sure, and that, that phrase properly processed, I understand what you're talking about. We're gonna, I'm gonna fr change that phrase for the sake of conversation to more naturally processed, right? Um, sure, it can, but remember, all art, all creativity, it's subjective, right? So the real question is actually the first one. How can you tell when you over-processed or over-edited? So there's a couple pieces of information that I can give you that I think will help you, but there's no simple answer. Like, I can't tell you um, you know, if it's, if the face starts to look this degree of plastic, it's overprocessed, whatever. Um, it's one of those things that with some practice in terms of your processing skills and training your eyes, which we're all working on to, uh, really pay attention to details and to see things a little bit, um, more clearly through the eyes of others you will kind of learn where that sits. But here's what I'll tell you has been my experience. So number one, when it comes to learning retouching, I liken it to going on a roller coaster ride, meaning you start out, you've got no skills. So you're at the bottom of the first hill. You have no idea what's ahead of you and you're a little bit intimidated by it. And as you start to learn things and you start to pick up some skills, 
you start climbing that hill and your work starts improving, which is really exciting, right? And then you reach a point, which is the top of the first hill, that big hill, where you kind of look back and think, wow, look where I was, look where I am, my work, it looks so cool. And then you tip over the top of the hill and you start to go down that first big hill. Well, while you're going down that first big hill, the quality of your work is actually starting to go down too, because what's happening is you're actually kind of so excited about all these things that you can do now, you tend to overdo them. We all do. Everyone I've ever watched, learn, myself, every photographer that I've ever talked to, it's just a natural thing. It's a human thing. And then on the way down, you kind of take a look back at your work and you start to realize like, ooh, I've overdone it a little bit. So, you know, you hit bottom and you back off a little and then your work starts to climb back up the second hill. And while you're on the way up the second hill, you start to learn some other new te techniques and some other skills and things get even better yet. And even though the second hill is not as big as the first hill, it's really exciting because the work's getting better and better. But then you crest that second hill and start going down. And on the way down, you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, those two new techniques that I learned, I'm overdoing them a little bit. I got to back it off, right? So that's what you're going to experience, number one. Number two, uh, ultimately, only you can decide what's over-processed or over-edited. However, if you go back to my conversation about what's best, keep in mind the other questions, the why, what, when, where, how. Why did you take the picture? Is it a portrait for a business website? Well, if it's a portrait for a business website, you probably shouldn't do like a glamour retouching because that's gonna look a little weird, right? It should be probably a little bit more natural. Uh, if it's a portrait for uh, a dating app, well, then the person's gonna to wanna to look their best, so they're gonna want some retouching, but at the same time, you don't wanna completely overdo it either because then when they meet someone from that app, they don't look like themselves. So the real answer to your question comes down to context, okay? Now, Andre had a second question uh, that I owe him an answer to. Uh, he says, I'm using Darktable and it's very in-depth. Yep. Uh, looks like there's quite a number of ways of doing the same thing. Yes, just like in Photoshop. Um, and then his question is, is there a certain optimal way of processing to avoid overloading the image or the computer? Uh, and he does have a secondary question to that. So um, the best answer I can give you, Andre, is you're correct in your observations. And is there an optimal way? No. The optimal way is going to be the way that makes the most sense to you while giving you the outcome that you desire in the shortest amount of time. The only way that you figure that out is by trying them all and experimenting, right? Uh, Andre does go on to ask him, do I have any tips on like what the different tools do in that? I don't specifically for Darktable, but you can Google that and you will find tons of information. Uh, I'm also confident that there are uh, probably tons of videos that are out there um, you know, about Darktable. I know there are quite a few very dedicated Darktable users that put out a lot of content. Uh, in fact, if you Google a gentleman from Australia, um, he, um, his name is Bruce Williams. Uh, or actually look for him on YouTube. He does a lot of videos and tutorials about Darktable uh, and will potentially be able to help you out there a little bit, okay? All right, so I am scrolling back through the list of questions here. Um, and let's see. Um, Michael's got a question. I don't know about this one, Michael. This hopefully, maybe this is a crowdsource one because I don't think I am going to have a great answer for you. Let me get back here so I can uh, put it on the screen. Um, he says, is anyone having problems with Lightroom 13 converting uh, the V12 catalogs? Um, folks, if any of you happen to know that, uh, even if you're watching the replay and can help out with that, type some information, maybe point Michael in the right direction. 
Uh, Mike, I'm sorry. I'm not a Lightroom user. I don't use the catalogs, and I, I, I don't even want to guess and send you on a wild goose chase because I know how frustrating that kind of stuff is. Um, I would say um, I find that with software situations like that, more often than not, if I have the problem, there's a lot of other people that have the problem, which means that there's going to be a lot of support information available. So I would check out the Adobe website and their forums first. If you're looking for maybe maybe you can get lucky enough to find a quick fix kind of scenario. Uh, and then if not, you know, you may have to reach out to Adobe support and, and see what your options are there. But unfortunately, I don't have um, a, an ideal suggestion for you there. Okay. All right, I'm scrolling on down here. Folks, we still have a little bit of time, so type some questions in. How can I help you there, okay? Um, oh, Anya, there's a, a, a great quote. And you know, I used to know who that came from, the best hack. Never expect results from the work that you did not do. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you folks may or may not know, you've seen the pictures. My grandson plays baseball, so I'm a big baseball fan. The Philadelphia Phillies, go Phils. They're uh, in the National League championship series right now and one of the things that we teach young baseball players is you can't steal second base with one foot on first so yeah you're not going to get results if you you don't do the work uh and unfortunately gang you know that whole idea of asking the simple questions the lazy questions it's just not not going to get you where you know you need to go at all and it may solve a problem that's like standing in front of you so you can go make a picture but it really hasn't helped you. It really hasn't. Because if you actually understood the solution in that moment, you probably would have been able to be that much more creative and do even more, right? Um, Anya's question here, um, what do you think about ring light catch lights? Um, Anya, I think probably I think about them the same as most people do at this point. Sick and tired of seeing them, right? Um, I've never liked them at all period, uh, simply because they are distracting and very unnatural. Um, that being said, if you have a ring light, you know, if you have limited resources, but happen to have a ring light and want to be able to use it, keep in mind, it's just a light. So you can take that ring light and you can move it off to the side. And now you don't have the circular catch lights in the eyes, right? It's maybe it's your, your fill light or, or something like that. That's an option. Uh, I do own a ring light. I own the Godox uh, ring light attachment for the 8200s, but I never use it for close-ups or portrait work. I literally, this it was kind of a gas purchase for me. I'm not going to lie. I, I fall for that too, but I have a specific lighting technique that I do, and I'll try to make it a point to, to make one of those images that shoot breakdown um, in a couple of weeks, okay? But... Um, I have a lighting technique that I do where I use the ring light and I place the subject about a foot off of a background, a colored background. Um, that ring light creates kind of a ghost shadow around the person. And because it's a full length or a three quarter length picture, the catch light is so small, we don't see that it's the circular catch light. It just looks like a regular catch light. Um, but even then you have to be a little bit careful because depending on where you're shooting, top to bottom. So if you're positioning your camera at the midpoint of the person's body, that puts the catch light below the horizon line in their eyes, if you do that. So again, th there are trade-offs in that respect. Um, so I'm not a big fan of ring lights unless they have been used in a very creative way. That's, that's the whole key, right? So that would be my kind of challenge to you if you're going to use a ring light. Uh, let's see here. Red Rob, how did you find paying clients when you started? <laughs> That's the ultimate question. So keep in mind, you know, I, the first time I had to worry about paying clients, let's do it that way, worry about paying clients was 1982, 83. So when I left the newspaper business and had this incredibly stupid idea that I was going to open a portrait and wedding studio. Uh, stupid because I failed initially. Uh, I've told that story many times. And thanks to a, a loan manager at a bank who really saved my butt, did not repossess my car and taught me how to actually financially run a business that I was able to turn into an extremely successful business. But um, that was in the 1980s. So you found uh, customers two ways, literally two ways. Um, okay. 
there was a third and fourth. I'll tell you all four of them. But the third and fourth, I never used. I never did them. Number one, uh, photographers who were successful. And by the way, I'm telling you this story because it's actually the same answer for today. So I will connect the dots for you. Um, photographers who were successful, meaning they were they were making money and paying their bills, they took out ads in the yellow pages. Um, and it literally correlated. The, the, the more money the photographer was making, the bigger the ad they would take out in the yellow pages. Uh, and people would look at that and say, oh, this photographer must be better because they have a bigger ad. I'm not kidding. That was the thought process. Those of you that are old enough, you know, you did it. You were more likely to call you know, a company that had the bigger ad than, than the little tiny ad, right? So uh, number one version of marketing was the yellow pages. The second version was word of mouth. The challenge back then was, you know, word of mouth from an excellent customer experience that you've provided could take six months, a year, two years, or more to kind of cycle back around and give you a new client or, or you know, a new job. So um, while it worked and it was very effective, uh, it wasn't exactly efficient, at least not by today's standards, right? Uh, I mentioned it's kind of a third and a fourth. The third and a fourth... Um, in small towns, a lot of photographers would take out small ads in the little, uh, we used to call them penny pincher uh, newspapers, right? Kind of the little community type newspapers where you could get small ads in the classifieds or small display ads really inexpensively. Um, the problem with those, that was kind of like the newspaper version of advertising your photography on Craigslist, right? Um, the people that were looking for photographers in those uh, penny pinchers or shopper newspapers, they were the clients that didn't really have a budget. They didn't have a lot of money. So they were the clients where today, you know, we, we call them tire kickers, whatever, but they were the clients that um, you were kind of bottom feeding financially if you were going after those clients. But for some photographers, that was their place and, and that's how they survived. Uh, and then literally the other version was... Um, Brochures and flyers. Uh, literally a lot of photographers in, in the areas where I worked would actually print out little eight and a half by 11 flyers with the little peel off pieces at the bottom and stick them on the community bulletin boards where you walk into the supermarket, right? And advertise, um, you know, specials on Christmas portraits or family portraits or that kind of stuff. Um, that's how you got business. Um Fast forward to today, which I'm going to assume that's really more of what you're interested in, you know, is how can I get clients now? Um, it's actually really the the same way as what we used to do it, okay? Uh, but let me explain. So the yellow pages. We don't need the yellow pages today because we have this thing called social media. And that's where people go, which is awesome because we don't have to pay for social media, which is incredible, right? Uh, the problem is most photographers haven't figured out how to use social media properly. And it's really very, very unfortunate because I use social media exactly the same way I marketed my business in 1986. Exactly the same way. Social media and advertising on social media is not some invention of technology, right? Social media marketing is not a technology thing. Social media marketing is using technology, social media platforms, to be social. It's using these platforms to do exactly the same things that we did back in the 1980s, the same things that people were doing, that businesses were doing in the 1960s, in the 1950s, because it actually hasn't changed. People haven't changed that much in terms of what motivates people, in terms of what attracts people, in terms of what gets their attention, in terms of what makes them pull the trigger to make a purchase. That's all the same. It's all the same technology, excuse me, psychology. None of that's changed. It's just that now we do it using technology. But photographers suck as a category. So don't get mad at me. I'm probably picking on some of you, but not all of you. Photographers suck at being social with technology. If you're one of those photographers, Red, that posts a picture on social media, just a picture, and expects that people are going to reach out to you, you're not going to do anything. If you're one of those photographers that puts a post up on social media, hey, I've got three openings on Saturday for mini sessions, 
DM me, whatever. You're not going to get many people DM you unless you're charging rock bottom cheap prices, meaning you're not making any money, right? Social media, those two words. What's the first word? Social. Posting a picture on social media without any information. And I'll tell you what kind of information it be, but so putting a, a picture on social media without any information, here, bear with me one second. It's kind of the equivalent of walking into a party with people that you've never met. I, you know what, for that matter, people that you know. It's like walking into a party, seeing somebody and walking up to them and going, What's that person thinking? What's that person supposed to say? What are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to say, oh, that's nice. They're probably going to feel obligated to ask you questions about it. Is that going to make them want to put money in your pocket and hire you? No, of course not. Why should they care about that picture? Right? They shouldn't. So when posting on social media, you have to be social. Tell stories. Not about you because nobody cares. They care about their experience. Talk about how much fun it was to do the shoot. Talk about how much effort you put into finding that great location. All those kinds of things. But you got to tell stories. What did we talk about before? Even when I was talking about, you know, the, the questions and, and the best, right? It's about storytelling. That's what photography is. It's storytelling. Every picture you take, you tell somebody a story about it. If you show it to somebody in person. But yet on social media, slap that picture up there. There is, right? So that's the, the problem with that. But Red, it sounds to me, we still got a few minutes. Uh, it sounds to me like you still, like you have some struggles and you're trying to do business-wise. Give me a little bit more information and tell me some of what your struggles are. And I will help you solve some problems. I'll help point you in the right direction. I love talking business stuff. I don't get enough people that ask me business questions, right? Um, but yeah, actually finding clients then was really no different than finding clients now. It's just that the vehicle has changed. And that's where so many photographers str struggle. Even younger photographers, um, they struggle with that concept because they actually don't know how to be social. That's the challenge, right? All right, let's see here. I got another couple of questions. Um, I share most of my photos on Instagram, but once I've posted, I often notice that the photo looks underexposed, although it doesn't when looking at it on my computer. Do I know what's going on here? I sure do. Um, you have one of several things going on and possibly a combination of all of them going on, right? So number one, the way you solve this problem is you have got to make sure that you are calibrating your computer screens, right? So super important, Jeff. Um, if you really want consistency in your work, you got to calibrate your screens. Once you know you got your computer screen calibrated, then you have to ask yourself, where do I have the brightness setting on my phone? Right? If you've got your phone on auto brightness, that means every time you look at the phone, every picture you have is going to look completely different. So, you know, for me, I have usually have my brightness uh, on my phone set kind of pretty much like right in the middle, right, of the, the brightness scale. And that's kind of where I leave it, right? I don't want it up all the way bright. But how did I come to that conclusion? Calibrated my computer. Put a picture on the screen that I had worked on that I liked the way it looked and a picture that had good range to it. Put a copy of that picture on the phone and held the phone right next to the computer monitor and adjusted the brightness of the phone until the two images looked the same. One of the challenges, Jeff, when you put pictures online, um, it's impossible to completely control the experience that every other person will have with your picture for that very reason. Most people don't have color calibrated monitors. Uh, most people don't have calibrated phones. Uh, you know, they may have true tone turned on their phone, which is going to make all your images yellow if you're an Apple user, right? Or they're an Apple user. Uh, so there's all those factors. But for your own situation, yeah, it's a calibration issue. So uh, it starts with the idea you should definitely have your computer calibrated. Uh, and if you already have, um, literally just put the same picture on both devices, hold it next to the screen and adjust the phone. And now that's where you want your phone. Done right? But that doesn't mean it's going to look amazing on every single person's 
device. Unfortunately, there's uh, there's actually no way for us to be able to you know to control that yet. Uh, maybe down the road, who knows? But um, I I kind of don't see see that happening. Okay. All right. I think I got all the questions. Oh wait, uh, L Rams got one here. Uh, Joe, how do you deal with customers who are never pleased, even though you as a photographer are really clear as to what they were getting uh, with samples and style and fully under contract? Yeah, that's always a fun question. So um, I guess what concerns me about your question, Aram, let me start here, is that you use the word customers, meaning plural. So I don't know you, I know nothing about your work, right? And And since we're coming up close to the end of the show, uh, I would love it if you'd be willing to share maybe a little bit more information with me, uh, maybe in the comments afterwards about your workflow and that. Come back next week. I promise I will spend some, even more time with you. But here's some things that come to top of mind. Number one, when I hear plural, that usually says to me that you've got to start looking at your workflow better. Now, Obviously, I can't make an accusation because I don't know you. I haven't seen what you communicate and what you tell people, et cetera. But think of it this way. One thing that we know for sure, because we've all experienced this, all of us, I don't care if you're doing business or not doing business, right? When you make something or you build something or you schedule something or plan, shoot, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, you understand it because it came out of your head. You thought through it. You figured it all out. You get it. And then we find ourselves kind of gobsmacked sometimes because we thought we explained it so clearly, so simply, so obviously, but yet the other person, it's like, how do you not understand? Trust me, I've been there many times. I, that's part of the human experience. So if you legitimately have a plural situation there, that says to me that you need to work a little bit harder about communicating not in your mindset, but in your client's mindset. You need to look at where those disconnects have been, those misunderstandings. And you have to look at the language that you're using when you send the emails or when you put your marketing information on your website, wherever this breakdown's happening, you have to look at that language and say, how do I need to change it? Very cautionary tale though, don't become the photographer who winds up with a website or a contractor email where it's basically like this long list of no. Can't do this. Can't do that. Can't do this. Can't, right? Don't write these uh, situations out of, um, out of frustration, okay? Um, you have to be willing to kind of own the disconnect yourself and then try to communicate things differently. Um I will also tell you, I have experienced many times, but all but maybe once or twice, I've caught it before it got too far. I've experienced situations where people come to me and say, oh my God, I love your work. It's amazing. It's amazing. Can you do this? Meaning they want something that some other photographer did. And, and then if you go look at my website, there's nothing on my website that looks anything like this picture they're showing me, Right. In my younger days, I would make an attempt to do what they were after until somebody pointed out to me, you realize the only reason they're asking you to do it is not because they actually like your work better. They're asking you to do it because you're cheaper. Last time I ever fell for that one, right? Think that through. If there's this amazing picture or style by this amazing photographer, why would they come to you? Right. So that's kind of the challenge with that kind of stuff. And then the last thing I will say, uh, and I would need to know a little bit more about your workflow and all that kind of stuff. Um, I rarely use contracts. Now I know there are a lot of lawyers floating around. In fact, there's probably even one listening tonight who just rolled his eyes. Okay. Um, I rarely use contracts. I, I, I am not a big fan of litigious people. So I avoid litigious people like the plague. Uh, and of course, oftentimes you don't know that a person is litigious until it's too late. So um, I'm a big believer in transparency and being straightforward, um, providing lots of detail upfront, 
uh, not leaving things to assumption. Um, and because I find that, that contracts, and, and not everybody's going to agree with me. So I'm, I mean, I'm being really honest with all of you and, and take this advice accordingly, right? Never take legal advice from some guy you found on YouTube, please. Okay. Uh, so I'm not saying you're wrong, Al Ram, for using a contract. But um, what I do encourage people to understand, though, that for the average person that wants a picture or a photo shoot, the minute they hear a contract, that's like, contract? I just want a picture. I mean, honestly, that's how I think, right? I think that's how most of you think. So it's about finding a balance. What I'm, what I'm pushing for there is if, if the contract is important to you, I respect that. And especially if you're, you know, if you spent money for an attorney and the attorney's saying, yeah. but don't be afraid to push back on the attorney and say, all right, look, you've got to simplify this. I need this so that anybody can read it and understand it. Because attorneys get paid by the syllables, right? We all know that joke. Okay, and that's the challenge. So you wind up with a contract that nobody can freaking understand because it's a lot of double speak, right? Um, and, and look, I respect attorneys; they have their place in the world, but not for this stuff. So you also have to question yourself: do, do you do you need that contract, or do you just need to do a better job of communicating the details? Leave me information in the chat, I'll Rem, and I'll gladly do my best to help you out. I, again, folks, I love to have these business discussions and and be able to get into the degree to help people, um, but. We're out of time. So I want to thank all of you for watching. I hope that you found some value in what I shared tonight. Um, next week, more school stuff. Um, I will have a shoot breakdown for you next week, along with, of course, uh, last frame Q&A. If you can't make it to the show live, I've said this a couple times tonight, leave your question in the comments below, and I will answer it next week. And gang, if you still haven't done so, please hit a thumbs up. It helps more photographers find out about the show. So remember, folks, you don't get back the days that you waste. So go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Hashtag do the work, gang. Adios. Have a great week.